Um, I'll start by giving a little bit of background about myself. Um, a while back, I used, I used to work in, um, I did my doctorate in uh, machine learning for early warning scores um, to be used in hospitals to try and identify early deterioration of patients before catastrophic events. And when I was working on that, it was interesting because I was working on the project from 2004 to 2008. The data started being collected in 1999, so I had lots of data for my doctorate, and we did a few more trials. Then a year or so, the new scientists were saying that we'd regressed from automatically capturing the data from bedside monitors to nurses typing into an iPad using the same algorithm, um, the observations. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, we're now in 2019, so it's taken 20 years for what was a very sensible approach of using machine learning to identify patient deterioration. We had great models, and it makes a lot more sense than things like Muse2, but it's along those same lines. But actually, to get these things happening just takes a lot more effort. And that's part of the reason that I've sort of gone full circle in terms of coming to health, is to actually work on the less um, sexy, less machine learning, and actually just sort out the fundamental data and, and the software that people use day to day. So after my doctorate, I went um, and found an online travel startup. So I decided to go to an industry that was a bit moved more quickly. And that was bought by Skyscanner. I was at Skyscanner, so we grew from 50 to 800 people. Um, and I was CTO there. But afterwards, I decided I did want to go back to health. And a year and a half ago, my now boss um, was put in touch with me by a friend. And he wanted to do something very different in Scotland in terms of how we deliver health and social care and, and transform the way that we um, we use technology and move from a world of sort of big procurements that run for decades to a very different approach to delivering healthcare. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. To give a bit of context on Scotland, this is um, a map of Scotland. You see um, there are islands. It's quite a diverse country. So this means that um, the specific needs around healthcare and data. So things like video consultations are important. If you could enable a patient to, for example, provide a blood pressure reading, that may save them a two and a half hour round trip to a GP. If they're in care, then that may be a you know, two and a half hour taxi ride to a GP. So it's very different to somewhere like central London or, or doing something on that scale. Population of 5.4 million people. Um, in Shetland, there aren't any MRI scanners. So if you're in Shetland, you'd have to get flown to Aberdeen in order to get MRI scan done. So it's an interesting and complex landscape. The NHS is divided up into um, 14 territorial boards. So these are um, geographical regions, which range from uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which is the largest health board in Europe, down to, um, again, Shetland in terms of one of the smaller ones, Orkney's another um, health board. So there's a massive variety there. But it's potentially quite fragmented. And then we also have 32 different local authorities. So when it comes to social care, which is also what we're working on, then that's even more fragmented. So different um, places will have different technologies. And then finally, we have the voluntary sector working in health and social care as well. So there you've got thousands of organizations who are looking after tens of thousands of people in care homes or people who are receiving care at home. So you, you see there's an awful lot of fragmentation there. And that means that the data are also fragmented into different geographies and different places, but also different parts of care, whether it's um, primary care, secondary care, social care, voluntary sector systems. So there's lots and lots of fragmentation. Here's a quote from Thomas in the audience. Hospitals are still full of hundreds of different systems that don't communicate replicated data and sad web portal projects, creating a thin veneer of optimism <laughs> over a bottomless well of nihilistic denial. Uh, <laughs> Every time someone talks about a portal project in Scotland, I retweet this. Um, it's, it's not to say that there's no room for portals, but they, we're using them as a way of trying to overcome the actual core problem, which is a very, very fragmented data record. The background, incidentally, was me looking for um, a picture of a portal, because whenever I hear the word portal, I think of something from sci-fi. This one looked like a black hole, which seemed particularly topical. Now, we do have some national systems in Scotland. Um, this is the child health immunization system. It was very pioneering in its day. It's, it's older than I am. Um, 
and it, it runs on a mainframe, but it holds absolutely critical data about what vaccinations children have in Scotland. It's got lots of logic in terms of um, what to do if there aren't enough vaccines at a certain point in time to make sure everybody gets them. Um, some of the elderly population vaccinations also go in this child health vaccination system, but clearly it's in need of, of a refresh, and um, it's quite difficult to get the data out of it. In fact, it's almost impossible, and it tends to be transcribed. Um, but yeah, at its time, it was been a brilliant system. Um, another critical system in Scotland is our community health index. Um, every single medical encounter is tracked against a single number that identifies that citizen. So theoretically, we can link together all our data. It's just it's in lots of different places. There are also a handful of other systems that are developed nationally and rolled out differently in different health boards. So there's a little bit of commonality there, but not anything what, like what we'd like to be able to, like to see. So about two years ago, the Scottish Parliament decided to do a report and look at how technology was being used in health and social care in Scotland. And they thought they'd see really brilliant stuff going on, examples of how technology was making life better, but that isn't what they said. What they said was actually technology was getting in the way of people doing their jobs, things were very fragmented, there were lots of pilots, projects, but things didn't get rolled out. I was a bit worried when Ian said, we're doing a project, we're not doing a project. We're, we're building a platform that's the future of healthcare in Scotland, not a project, and we won't be finished. Um, so that report said, it is no longer acceptable in this age that our health service is using multiple incompatible systems. The best way forward for sharing is through a single platform. So that came from the Parliament, Health and Sport Committee. We also, um, around that time, commissioned an expert panel to do, uh, um, to look into how we could use improve health and social care using technology in Scotland. This involved people from the US, um, Andalusia, other places around Europe, talking about, well, what are the things that digital health and social care should look like in Scotland? There were lots of sensible suggestions in there around patient access to records and other things. But again, we get this idea of a single open platform be implemented by the health and social care, which utilizes open standards such as open APIs. So again, they're saying, actually, open standards, open APIs, open platform. And that's what's really driven the digital health and social care strategy in Scotland, which was published in March of last year. And that calls for a number of different things, one of which is to um, sort out our information governance landscape to improve data sharing between different parts of the care and different health boards. The other bit is to improve um, the digital skills of workforce in health and social care, but also critically, to build what they, we call a national digital platform. So essentially enabling people to do th one of three things. Firstly, at the point of care, the information is available that that person needs. And, that, and they're also able to contribute back to that information, that record at the point of care. Secondly, it's predictable to build new applications. So currently, if you want to, as a, as a vendor or even building a statutory application, if you want to roll that out across Scotland, that needs to work against the 14 different health board systems and the 32 different council systems and the thousands of different voluntary sector systems. So there should be a, a single interface. It should be predictable to do these things. And the third thing is, with all this data in one place, how do we use it to deliver improvements in our service, whether that's um, looking at how vaccination uptake is in a particular region or looking at different um, sort of disease pathways and areas, and also using the data to fuel clinical research, working in areas such as precision medicine, where we begin to join together different data sets and look at the outcomes of patients with different medicines. So we've got a very clear mandate here to do something different and what we should do with our platform. The Scottish Government asked um, a health board in Scotland um, so we have some national health boards, and one of them is called NHS Education for Scotland, and it asked them to help with delivery of this. And this was important because it was a health board that had people in it who are in the business of building software that runs on the cloud using agile methods within the organization rather than sort of by configure run and passing things off to big systems integrators. The picture is from a, a workshop that ran last week. Um, we're working with some endo endocrinologists, with one of our service designers, looking at um, what the current sort of flow is for patients, what's working and what isn't working. Um, we work in cross-functional teams, so we have um, 
domain experts, so clinical informaticians, people who understand clinical modeling. We have service designers, user interface designers, software engineers, information governance people working together to, to build projects. And this isn't about having to build everything ourselves. We can still buy software, but by doing that, we know what we're buying, we know what we're gluing together, and we'll focus on building the work that differentiates us or that we can't just buy off the shelf. Everything we work on, we're um, going to open source. So we, we want to make sure that we're part of a, a bigger solution here in terms of what happens with open platforms. And I'll talk a bit more about the Aperta Open Platforms group later on, which we're a member of. So how are we actually approaching this? Well, we, we're not going to go away and hide for a few years and come back with a big architecture of national digital platform. We're starting off by building products, something that solves the problem today. And the first product we've, um, we're rolling out is to support this particular type of anticipatory care plan, which is um, part of what's called the RESPECT process. It's, it's a standardized process from Resuscitation UK, and it's about patients expressing what they wish to happen to them in the event of an emergency if they can't communicate their wishes. So perhaps they do wish to be admitted to hospital, perhaps they don't wish to be admitted to hospital. And there are several reasons why we've chosen this. Um, firstly, it's exactly the kind of data that aren't being shared across health and social care at the moment. It's, it's a document that needs to be authored by multiple people. It may be authored by a GP, a geriatrician in a hospital, a palliative care consultant, um, a nurse visiting a care home. Lots of people need to author this document. And critically, it may need to be accessed in any number of contexts. It could be a paramedic from the Scottish Ambulance Service. It could be an A&E doctor. It could be any number of things. It could be a patient printing out a copy for themselves or letting their son or daughter know that they have a plan. So this is exactly the type of problem we're trying to solve. There's lots of clinical support for doing this because um, it's been rolled out in a number of health boards and they've been rolled out as a paper process and I'll show you the form shortly. And they've been hitting the edges of what you can achieve with the paper process. Um, scanning departments are complaining, not all the forms get scanned, um, not all of the ACPs get filled out when people make the transition from uh, primary care to, to secondary. Sorry, sorry, out of hospitals and discharged back into the community. So there's a group of people who are hungry for this change, clinicians who are willing to, sort of, um, to put in the time and effort to make this happen. And thirdly, it's a policy priority for the Scottish Government is improving palliative care and around ACP. So there's, there's kind of a, a number of things around this that made it a sensible thing for us to do. So this is the actual form that we implemented. When I was first talking about this, a little over a year ago, I said it was a simple form. Um, that was a big mistake. Uh, we, we worked on the first version of the application with some help from the Ripple Foundation whilst we were building up our own capabilities, and we learned that actually there's a lot of complexity in the form. As it happens, the form had already been modeled as an open air template um, by, sort of, so I think, sponsored by the palliative care um, group within Scottish Government and had work on it both from Inn and then other people within Scotland. Um, so that was kind of a happy, happy fortunate thing that it existed, but it's, it's actually a, a very complicated document. This is what it looks like in um, our user acceptance testing environment, which is why it has sort of strange red stripes at the top so people know it's not a real environment. Um, so you, you know, it's, it's now electronic. Just going through that journey has been interesting because it's really about working with the clinicians to understand that this, this doesn't have to be the form anymore. They can have any view onto the data. This is now an open air template, and that captures that in a composition. And actually, we can have whatever view you want. If you want to resuscitate, don't resuscitate view, that's fine. We don't have to be limited to the, the sort of PDF view that we had previously. Now, in reality, we have to integrate with existing systems. So this is the, the portal that's used in Fourth Valley. It's only used in Fourth Valley but we need to be able to make sure that we can link out to our application and our document from that. So there's a now purple section on this saying respect form in place. Do you click on that to access it. We have to work around the existing way that identities are handled in the health board, how the existing master patient index works. We, the application produces a PDF version of the form, which means it can go into existing document management systems. So we, we're delivering things in a new way and using open EHR, but we're making sure that we do it in a way that's still safe and consistent and makes things better and slightly safer than they currently are. And over time, we'll build up the record in order to do this. 
So where do we take this from now? Well, one of the things we could do is in terms of rolling it out to different regions within Scotland who are also implementing respect process, such as um, NHS borders, and we could do that. But there's a lot of variety in ACPs that are being used. So if we look in different parts of Scotland, different health boards are using different ACPs. But can we use open air to look at what are the common elements of those ACPs and produce a, a generalized ACP that's available in the platform that then other people can sort of put ACPs into over time and produce a fuller view. Now, I talked about some of the, the good things that have happened in Scotland in terms of IT, and one of those things that happened some time ago, maybe 12 or 15 years ago, was the introduction of something called the Emergency Care Summary. And this was a small bit of data that would be shared from primary care to the rest of the health system around medications, allergies, and demographics. And over time, that has morphed to include some simple anticipatory care plan information. But this system is very limited because it can only be authored by a GP. So if someone's in a hospice under palliative care, their consultant would need to ask the GP to update it. So, in, so as well as expanding from just a respect anticipatory care plan, we're looking at building out more data that you'd find in a key information system, so around allergies, medications, and um, and, and, and other bits of data, building that out over time so we can build out a full record for a patient. But ultimately, we want to have the whole health record within Open EHR. It's just we're building it out in terms of priority and what's useful. Now, what we've built here isn't just a form or just an application. What we're doing is actually finding a viral vector for delivering an open health platform into our existing system. So this is a way of getting in there, sort of getting a little slice of functionality in there, and then we'll expand out from that area. And, and by doing that, we can make sure we're building the right thing and learn every step from delivery. So how do we start from a technical perspective? Well, um, fairly early on, I came across this document um, built by the, written by the Aperta Foundation. Some of the authors are in this room. And it had this useful concept around a minimum viable open platform. What are the minimum things you need in order to, to deliver an open platform? And actually, you only need a few things. You need authentication, so can clinicians log in to view or edit a respect form? Is there a patient index so that we can pull in the demographics for that patient and make sure we can look up which patients have forms or not? Um, a directory of staff and services available, and a clinical data repository using OpenEHR to store those data. And that's kind of all we need just to build that first application. Yes, there are other things we need later on, such as terminology servers, but actually we can get a really long way with just this, and it's a very powerful concept. In terms of what this application then looks like, um, if you've got citizens looking at... Um, so you've got citizen here, and she's basically looking at what... Um, Watch, maybe she's wanting to get a new test result. Maybe she's um, booking an appointment. You've got a caregiver. They needed some information. And also someone who's operating the system. How are things working? Where are the queues? Where are different people? And we have this idea of a service layer. And that service layer is delivering a series of verbs, things that you want to be able to do. Can you check if some? Can you check if uh, a new test result's available? Can you order a new prescription, get a notification of when something's going to happen, requesting a blood test, updating a record, booking an appointment, viewing your record? So these are all verbs you need to do, but again, they're just powered by these simple building blocks of the platform that we keep reusing. So our patient index, our staff index. So I got a sign from... OK, right, I, I thought I had 15 minutes left, and I got the five-minute warning. Yeah, yeah. OK, <laughs> slow down. Um, <laughs> um, patient index. Um, then we've got our OpenEHR clinical data repository. So that's where all our information is going in and, and other services that we need. So these are the building blocks that power those verbs that enable us to do the things that people on the left-hand side of the screen need to do. Um, we also need to start thinking about other types of data. So not all of our data is going to be structured. There's going to be lots of unstructured data, so not just things from packs. There will be full genome sequences, which won't contain any metadata. There will be um, videos of consultations, patients submitting photographs that they've taken of, of dermatology for, for dermatology reasons of their skin. And, and so we've got a lot of this unstructured blob-like data as well. So that, they'll have to go in the, in the data store too. Everything we do is hosted on the cloud, so part of the 
digital health and social care strategy was saying this is all going to run on the cloud. That's consistent with sort of Scottish government policy more widely, that we're not in the, in, we're not in the business of building and running data centers. And of course, we need to interact with all the things that currently exist uh, elsewhere. So you, there's gonna, there are lots of patient administration systems. Many of them are the same vendor, but they're all configured separately and deployed separately. Um, there's GP systems from different vendors. There are thousands of GP practices. Many of them have their own server or desktop computer that are running these. There are all the lab systems with all the integrations. The list goes on, but essentially, there's lots and lots of systems we are going to need to talk to. Ultimately, we want all these data to end up on the platform. We, all want, to, we want it all to sit within an open-air clinical data repository. But in the meantime, we're going to have to do things such as query those systems and pull data out, start getting streams of those data into our clinical data repository so we have a, um, so at least we have a copy of them. Um, and then we also already having to push data back into those systems, existing document management systems, to know about treatment summaries and other things that are going on. So this is, we're very much having to work with that world as well, but our direction of travel is basically to move from right to left and get as much as possible in the open air clinical data repository. In terms of technology specifics, so you, we are using the same login that um, citizens use elsewhere within Scotland. That's a program that's going, undergoing transformation at the moment. Um, but essentially, this means that we will have the same login and identity as, as local government. Within Scotland, Scotland's moving to Office 365 within the NHS. So that means we'll be able to move to a single identity for NHS staff in terms of, of login and be able to attach that to join as movers, leavers processes. So have sort of good authoritative information about, about staff. Um, it also means we can start reusing what role information there is available for staff. Of course, when we go to local government, some um, councils are moving to as your active directory, others won't, so we'll have to deal with other identity providers or providing our own. And when it gets to the voluntary sector, it will get even more sort of diverse and we'll have to figure out ways of, of handling it. But again, the bigger identity providers will are typically dominant in that area. The um, community health, gate, health index system, I'm pleased to say, is being replaced from the kind of black and green screen to uh, the next gate EMPI. Um, the, that, so that, that's a process that's going on at the moment. Um, we're currently using Ethesis as our clinical data repository, but we're also looking closely at um, Airbase, which is sort of a fork of Ethesis, largely because of um, some extra functionality we'll have in terms of um, being able to deploy it on r managed relational database services. It needs a few plugins, but that's a very technical point. Um, and for some of the integration, because we've had to produce some Fire APIs already, we've just been using H Happy Fire Server, but we need to determine what our overall integration engine is going to be for the connecting to the many hundreds of systems and looking at whether we use what's already used in Scotland or, or something different. And you'll see here there's a mixture of things. I'd like to say everything was free and open source. Um, it isn't, and I think, we've had, I think we have to have vendors here. I don't actually mind having some vendor solutions in, in here. It's all about architectural building blocks and the idea that, that any of these components can be interchanged and switched out when whatever we're needing to do that job isn't doing it anymore. And because we're in control, we can define those boundaries, we can define those interfaces and say, this is what a building block does. And here, we're going to go to tender for that. We'll get bids from companies. We'll integrate it ourselves, and then we can change it around. And it's a really big change of dynamic around what's happening. Now, to, going back out of the technical world, we want to make sure that our design language is consistent for different users. So right now, citizens, the people who deliver care, and the people who administrate care are on a very complex journey, traveling between different systems, things presented in different ways. And we're trying to make sure that our design language reflects um, a more consistent experience for those people so that they're actually going between different places, they've got a consistent experience, because ultimately, they're looking at the same record now. This is a, a single just different views on a single electronic health record, and that's an important concept for us. Imagine what that might look like, and I'm always nervous about mock-ups. It's about whether you're a citizen or a practitioner or someone running the system, you at least get a similar view or experience doing different things. Different tools will inevitably have to have different functionality, and uh, you know, a, a system a GP uses will be much more complex than it something that a patient is using just to book an appointment, but at least let's have consistency around our visual style. 
So what's next for us as an organization? Well, we're, we're building up capability. We've only got two teams of engineers working on this at the moment, um, one around the respect product and widen that out to different ACPs and other types of data that needs to be known in an emergency. Another team is dedicated to helping other teams build things on top of the platform. So a number of um, SMEs we're working with who want to push data to the, to the system of records, so ones around um, a trauma application who will be persisting their data using OpenEHR. Um, another one is around, but we're also working with people within the health service who want to start pushing data to um, OpenEHR within the clinical data repository. So we're beginning to get data from devices that would be held by citizens, such as um, uh, blood glucose measurements that go just a patch on the arm, producing blood glucose data. So again, how do they push that data into the platform such that it can be used as part of that care record? So we're helping other people build stuff on the platform whilst also building out the, the platform, the APIs ourselves. We're building up clinical modeling capability because clearly there's an awful lot of that to be done, as well as um, just to trying to uh, sort of get more people involved in the process of this sort of collaborative design of what we're doing. Now, I started my presentation with a map, um, a map of Scotland. On this map, Scotland's rather small. Um, we, we cannot do this alone, so we're keen to be part of um, a wider community doing this, so the community of people in this room, also people who aren't necessarily here today. So we're part of the Aperta Foundation Open Platforms group, so looking at what are the, what are the components you need for an open platform, um, can we get to the point of having an open source implementation of all of those so that you could ultimately spin up a platform and then for free and figure out what you need and then adapt and change and replace things as and how you want to. We need to work on the international clinical models. So whilst we're learning our clinical modeling workflow, make sure we um, learn from the models that both Aperta have sponsored, but also those that are used internationally and also start contributing back to those. So we, we very much see that this only works if we're part of a much bigger system. We're, we're only 5.4 million people. Vendors could ignore us if they want to. We're much more than England, for example. But actually, we want to use something much bigger and have a, a platform that's representative of what's going on elsewhere and contribute back to that community so that we can sort of do all of this together. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alistair. I'm sorry for messing up your timing, my mistake. We have time for probably one question. There may be more than one. I'll take a couple of questions, sorry. One at the back, two, two up the back there. So this sounds awful similar to the patient's guy talk this morning about Norway, which is a similar sized population and similarly geographically remote. Uh, have you been talking about how you can share kind of platform concepts and implementations and designs and such like with these people? So we haven't specifically spoken to Patient Sky, but I, I think it was a really interesting presentation. I was, I was tweeting about it earlier, but we, we have been engaging with the community more widely. So for example, when we're looking at establishing our clinical modeling practice area and how we build up that team, we've been talking to, to Celia in Norway and, and, people, and, and to NWIS and to um, in about how we do that, and um, and again, we're sort of trying to learn exactly how other people are doing this. We're we're noobs, and, and I've no desire to learn lessons that have already been learned in this room. So I very much want to see what's happening, and, and in areas things like analytics and 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 doing big sort of data research on top of it. That's also new for us, and again, just trying to find out how other people are solving that. Mm. About eighty percent of the data models are the same within those products and actually most of the products that you've heard talked about today. That's a start. It's not perfect, as we were talking before, but we're getting there. Another question? Uh, uh, look, this might seem really ignorant, so I apologise. I haven't been in the country that long. Um, do you, on, on the, it's sort of attached to that question that was asked just then, ultimately, uh, you know, decisions are made most likely around money. And so, with the unique Scottish 5 million population under its unique funding model, the NHS, are you looking, or is there a propensity to look at the cost to serve of patients across different pathways, point number one, and then potentially benchmark that cost even though the funding's different? Uh, and point number two, is, is, there, is there a propensity of the government of Scotland to call to account providers feeding into the network 
on the quality of their services, services and the value they bring. So it's a two, two points, but actually, primarily it's a, aligned or asking the question, is the money being benchmarked to ensure the cost of service has been delivered for the government? So you, I readily admit this is well outside of my realms of expertise, so I might have to get someone to give you a proper answer to that question. Um, as I, so the, what, what we're doing is, is funded out of the existing um, budget for uh, quote unquote IT within, <laughs> within Scotland. That, that as a proportion of the overall health budget I think is around 2%. That's gone down over the years. So I, I believe there's a perception of the, the sort of return on investment of IT within, within the system, but I don't know how it, from a governmental perspective or an NHS perspective around how the other bits work, I'm afraid. Okay, Alistair, thank you very much. Thanks.